بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise belongs to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah Jalla wa'ala be upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh <coughs> It is a great pleasure for me to be here with you in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to make us from those <coughs> who come under the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بِيُوتِ اللَّهِ No people they gather in the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَتْلُونَ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ فِي مَا بَيْنُهُمْ That they mention, recite the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they study that between themselves and no doubt we will mention an ayah or two and we hope that Allah Jalla wa'ala allows us to benefit from those verses and that if we are from those people that Allah wa ta'ala as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَ Except that the tranquility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will descend upon them إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ and that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will encompass them. وَحَفَتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And that the angels will cover them with their wings. وَذَكَرُهُمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهِ And that Allah Jalla wa'ala will mention those people present with those who hear this. We ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to make us from those people. Allahumma ameen. So, the title of the reminder is to do with leadership or al-qiyada in Arabic, leadership in Islam. And leadership is one of those responsibilities that is extremely important, not only for us to understand from a starting definition point, but its implementation, how it is, or who is to conduct to be a leader, and where we will get our information, our masadir, our sources of what it means to be a leader. Who is our inspiration? Now for Muslims, the answer is very clear. That the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is our inspiration of how to be a true leader. But we live in a world where not everybody will see what it is to be a leader like this. So if you think about the time from, let's say, the 7th century, according to the Gregorian calendar, the Prophet وسلم, appeared in this century. And at that time, there were two great powers. There were the Romans and then there were the Persians. And each of them vying for power. Each vying for authority over the earth. Having their leaders. And one inheriting leadership over the other. And in the Arabs, or the lands of Arabia at that time, is very much different. There wasn't such a power struggle of having one supreme leader. Because at the time, and even till now, if you can say that the land is very barren, it is very difficult. And at that time, there were many tribes, many infighting, and it was difficult to have that, if you like, one leader over the entire Arabian Peninsula. But around the rest of the world, leadership and power was something that was very much sought after. And as you look through the centuries, if you study history and you look at history, nothing much really has changed. Now for us, as Muslims, you understand leadership is, it's not just a job, something that may be put into the lap of a person. It's not something you pass around. It shouldn't be something that you pass around like in your family or your friends. But leadership, taking care of the affairs of, if you like, a community or a nation, the stakes are very high. And so therefore, the person who sits in that position should be the best of us. Now, it is an absolute, without any doubt, what we can say, a mas'uliyah. It is a responsibility, not just a job. And when we say a responsibility, we think about the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kullukum ra' wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyyatih. That all of you are like a shepherd, and all of you will be questioned about your flock, responsibility. Well, amiru ra' that the one who is authority of his people has, or he is a shepherd. وَالرَّجُلُ وَالرَّاعِ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ 
and that the man, the husband, the father is responsible for his family. And that the wife, she is responsible for the home of her husband and his children. And all of you are responsible. And all of you are or will be taken to account and are responsible for the position that you have been given. To be a leader in Islam means not just to have authority over people, but it means to serve the people. Because we have a dustur, we have, if you like, a source that we will refer back to, that how we will, or what we are supposed to ensure that the people, how they are leading their lives. And it doesn't go back to the personal decision of that individual, this is how we are going to have a society. So the leader themselves is merely implementing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So therefore he is there to serve and make sure that everybody is in line. If you do not see yourself, the responsibility that you have as a Muslim, being a leader, if you do not see it like this, then you have already failed. You have already failed if you do not see the responsibility that has been placed over you. And that whatever legacy whatever you think that, or basma, or thumbprint, or fingerprint that you think that you're going to leave with the people will simply die as you die. You will not leave anything with the people which is everlasting of any benefit, because what will benefit the people in the future is what? Is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us, and what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave to us. So how many leaders when their term has come to an end, and you can look throughout history, that their term comes to an end, and that, of course, Allah, Allah Azza wa Jalla will judge them, but the people can look back on their term and see how successful they were, what they did for their people, how they fulfilled their responsibility. And even now, it is possible to see in this virtual world where we can see the uh, conclusion of many leaders of different countries around the world, how they lived their lives, what wealth they may have accumulated in their well in their lives, and how they shared that wealth in their lives. Some of them, if you like, have done their stint, may travel around the world and give a half an hour lecture, a half an hour, a one hour talk, maybe a short seminar, and quite can quite easily charge a quarter of a million dollars, 200,000 pounds, just to give a short lecture because of the position that they had, the links that they set up in the leadership position that they had. And throughout history, the, the, shahab, the people, the normal people will look at that and that was their leader. When they traveled to a different country, when they arrived at the immigration office and they were thousands of miles away from the country, they pulled out their passport and they looked at the country or where that you came from. That person who sees where you came from, they have an image of your country, they have an image of what your leader is, what your society is like. Is that something that you can be, not in an arrogant way, is that something that you can be happy with, something that you can be proud that you live in such a place, that you have such a society, that you have such a leader who's doing this for you or not doing that for you? Maybe many Western countries you can travel and go to a different place and feel maybe quite embarrassed. Yes, maybe the passport has, uh, gives you the ability to enter many countries without a visa. But when they look at where you have come from, they maybe find it quite funny or even embarrassing that you live in such a society. But these are our leaders, these are our, for some, our abdal, our champions. If you look you know, in certain places you will see statues. And these are erected there to, to remember them for what they did for that particular land, for those particular people. And when you look at each and every single individual, what they stood up for and what they did, you will find it is lahum wa alayhim. There are times that are for them and there are times that also are very much against them. There is no individual that is spotlessly clean with what they did for their nation. But they may say, خَيْرُهُ أَكْثَرْ مِنْ شَرِّهِ Maybe. That his good or her good was more than their evil. 
and we're not necessarily spoiled for choice. So these are the few individuals that we can make some statues of, that we can erect on, around our, or be it not necessarily sacred in the religious sense, but the squares and the areas that they, where the movers and the shakers and the decisions are made, the centerpiece of parliaments and, and rulings and courts and so on, that is where they place their champions. And that is where they place their, their heroes. This is how history has panned itself, panned itself out. And this is the type of life and society that will be fought for, will be struggled for. And it is important that when we look at things like leadership, and we look at progression, and we look at development, and we look at things which will help individuals, we want to look at the finer details. We don't want to look at slogans or buzzwords to say that we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And it's the same as the last person who came along. And what's that all based upon? People are still waiting for some you know, tangible change. So you may find slogans like freedom and security and opportunity. These are three very important words that are used in, in Western civilization. Freedom, security and opportunity which in essence is a beautiful words, are good. That when we say freedoms, that there are, you're not restricted or imprisoned. Or for example, we're talking about security, we're talking about the opposition of, opposite of, of crime and lawlessness and chaos. And if you talk about opportunity, well, the opposite is a lack of opportunity. So these are good words. But then when you look at the reality of what that actually means in a society, and we're not talking about the space of six months or three months, over a period of years. What do these terms actually mean? And not only do what do they mean, where are they sourced from? Because what we saw a few years ago in terms of freedoms, those freedoms have changed now. The, the borders or the hudud of what was free has all changed. And, and security is, is constantly changing, according to whom they see as a potential threat or a danger to society. That's always changing. And opportunities constantly changing, maybe becoming less and less. So the people who are living in such a society where these phrases are used, but don't necessarily feel that there's a reality concerning these phrases can become disenfranchised, can be detached from what is actually going on. Because tomorrow morning, I need to be able to look after my children, be responsible towards my family. And if things like freedoms and opportunity and security have actually no reality, I mean, when was the last time we, talk, we spoke about what type of freedoms you are afforded? Well, what are we talking about here? Is it freedom for some and not for others? When we're talking about security, and there is, well, when was the last time we looked at crime statistics, maybe in our area? Maybe there's, there's a lack of security. And when we talk about opportunities, where life is becoming more expensive, it's becoming too expensive, Maybe there's a lack of opportunities. So the rich become richer, and maybe the poor, they are becoming poorer. I think this is a backdrop in when we're talking about leadership, and when we look at the greatest leader of all time, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not only we have the best example from mankind ever, the greatest individual to ever walk upon this earth, alayhi salatu wasalam, but we can feel so blessed how Allah Jalla wa was so merciful, is so merciful to us that he walked upon this earth and that his message والسلام, still remains with us. And that we don't have to rely on individuals. That the guidance of Allah Taala remains with us. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And bearing in mind the fact that Allah created us. Does not Allah Jalla know what he created? And that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knower of the subtleties and he is the most aware. We should feel the term in, in phrases with freedoms that Allah Jalla wa ala gave to us are crystal clear. In terms of security and how to achieve that is crystal clear. And the opportunities that should be afforded to us, that you are that you have the right or access, you should have the access to, are also made crystal clear in the divine guidance from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah Jalla wa gave us the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When I say us, mankind, 
not just to Muslims, not just to a particular place on earth, but to mankind, until the coming of the hour. And that he, sallallahu alayhi wa an individual of integrity, truthfulness, honestness, honesty, fairness and justice, cannot be compared to any other individual. So when you see a society who is sufficing themselves with morally corrupt people, morally bankrupt, who don't stand up for any moral decency. But somehow people are putting their faith and their hopes in people like that. You think that these people are in such dire need of something far better. That you don't deserve to only have these choices. That you as a human being are deserving of so much more. To have a life, to have an opportunity, opportunity to feel so much more happy. Real happiness that comes within, not you trying to purchase or buy some form of happiness which is absolutely temporal, which will last for a little while, will have a shelf life and will go away and then you are looking for something else. But you're looking for long-lasting happiness, sustainability with regards to these terms that I mentioned earlier about true leadership, about true freedom, what it means to be free. To be free from the restrictions of this dunya, not chasing the dunya, to understand real freedom. When Rib'i ibn Amir radiallahu anhu stood there in front of Rustum, the leader of the Persians, and presented him to presented him Islam, and he says that I want you to take take you from Dhiqad Dunya, I want you to take you from the restrictions of this worldly life to the openness the expansiveness of the Akhirah. These are the true freedoms. So we know that a person who is following another way will be truly restricted even though they think that they are free. They think they have the right to do as they like, but they don't. In fact, one who sees like the world that they are completely free has been completely duped and tricked by the shaitan actually being in the complete opposite. Because they have restricted their existence really only to this worldly life and what a restriction that is. So when we look at the life of the Prophet والسلام, the Muslim will say with the greatest leader ever to exist. Well of course you're going to say that. You're a Muslim. He is your Prophet. So maybe there are other statements. Maybe they are non-Muslims. And the famous Michael Hart, an individual who compiled a book the hundred most influential persons in history. There were no petrodollars given to him. There were no nationality given to him or promise. Nothing. He put the number one greatest individual, the most influential, in a positive manner, let it be said, was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is not a small thing. A non-Muslim to write such a book and to put the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam number one and justifying why that the Prophet ﷺ was the best leader, the most influential leader throughout history, even front, in front of his own Prophet, being a Christian individual, a Christian, him believing that Jesus was the Son of God, even before him. So it's quite a statement to say such a thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Prophets ﷺ as leaders for us to follow, for us to emulate. That you had in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam the very best of examples. None better. That he sallallahu alayhi wasallam was upon the greatest character and manner that you could ever find. That you are, and this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you are upon the very best of conduct. This is a tazkiyah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praising and telling us the status of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are firm thawabit, these are firm foundations and principles for us to understand the status of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, it may be said, well, you are a Muslim, of course you are going to say that. So then therefore, let's scrutinize and look at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is not an individual in the history of mankind who has been written about, who has been studied, whom research has been conducted upon, 
like the Prophet Muhammad the most detailed individual ever to be written about by non-Muslims and Muslims alike. So we have the books of Sunnah in the books of Ahadith in their thousands. And the non-Muslims throughout time writing about the Prophet Absolute no way of hiding anything. So therefore you have a 23 year period where we can look at the life of the Prophet as from the start, a Nabi, a leader, and those who are around him in the few number, only for them to grow and become bigger and more, if you want to put it, power and strength and authority gradually given to the Prophet and how he interacted and how he dealt with that particular responsibility. And maybe we can mention a couple of examples where if, as it is said, that he والسلام, sought other than delivering a peaceful message, delivering a divine message, that there was some form of self-fulfillment, then his life والسلام, is the complete opposite of that. That he والسلام, passed away and did not allow anything from his own property to be inherited, even from his own family. But it should be given away in charity. And that he stated that what would be inherited would be the knowledge, this divine knowledge. And that the scholars are warathatul anbiya, and that the scholars are the true inheritors of the prophets. Even though that he sallallahu alayhi wa had complete authority over the Arabian Peninsula at that time, it can be easily scrutinized as it, what it means to be a leader, a true leader. So, I think first and foremost, we look at responsibility. And I mentioned that at the very beginning. That one realizes the responsibility that was given to yourself. And that when the Quraysh, when they came to the Prophet wasallam, and they knew that his call was a firm and strong call, that the people were unfazed, and that they weren't turning back on their heels after they embraced Islam. They knew this was something that was going to affect and impact their community. So what did they say? If it is wealth you want, we will give you wealth. If it is authority and leadership, we will give that to you. If it, and anything you can imagine from these worldly, worldly gains that a person may seek, we will give that to you. The Prophet ﷺ refused all of that. He knew his responsibility, والسلام, he knew the job that Allah had given to him. And it wasn't to serve the dunya, it wasn't to accumulate in this worldly life, but to fulfill the responsibility that he knew that Allah had given to him. And similarly, for you to emulate that, is for you to know your responsibility. None of us are receiving wahi, of course. But the responsibility upon you as a father, as a brother, as a son, as a teacher, as a colleague, whatever that responsibility that you have, you are fully aware of how you should conduct yourself in that responsibility. And know that you will be taken account by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that responsibility. Therefore, you will conduct yourself in the correct way and try to fulfill that job in the very best manner. Because you know the better that you, you achieve in that particular job, because your job is ibadah, your intention is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are rewarded for that. Then the better you will be in the hereafter bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So responsibility is, is key, on understanding your responsibility is key. And at times, and it is of course very, uh, is a big fitna, that the more responsibility a person is given, where it affects more people, you're exposed to many more things, things that probably we cannot imagine. Things that sometimes we freely, we freely talk about. You know, things like, in maybe in coffee shops, even in the masjid or at home, relationships between countries, and why so-and-so made this comment, why so-and-so made that comment, without really understanding the full circumstances of that individual. Why are they saying this? And what would be the consequences of saying that and not saying that? Something that you and I are not exposed to. But it's very easy for us to have a very black and white way of looking at things. Well, it has to be like that, surely, where maybe 99% of the situation is completely hidden from you. So therefore, when we are talking about Muslims, we hold our tongues. 
we are very careful about how we address situations. It's very easy to talk about with the 1% knowledge that you have, the 5% or 2 pence, whatever you think that you have, but not take into consideration how much that you don't know. So therefore, with the greater responsibility, of course there is a greater, with the greater role, a greater responsibility. And it is easy, of course, it is easy with a person who is given more responsibility to fall by the wayside, to be purchased, to, to, to be offered certain things, and to be swayed by these worldly gains. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever responsibility that we have been given, or that we may be given, that we remain firm in adhering to what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah jalla wa'ala to protect us from falling into what our desires love over what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So you're constantly making dua in understanding your responsibility. And with this responsibility, as I mentioned to you, they go hand in hand is understanding the accountability before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what will make a true leader. Understanding your responsibility and knowing that you are accountable for what has been placed in your hands. Take yourselves to account before you are taken to account. So every day you ask yourself, have I done what I could have done? If you're involved in charity, if you're involved at your workplace, whatever workplace that you are doing, that yes, maybe you can take shortcuts, that yes, that maybe nobody will know about that. But the Muslim knows, Alam ya'alam bi anna Allah yara. The Muslim should know that you, don't you know that Allah sees you? So therefore you try to reach the level of ihsan, of perfection, or doing the very best that you can in anything that you do. Why? Because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question you about that. Don't fight, don't struggle to be the leader. Don't fight for that, where it is at the expense of others. That naturally things will take their natural course. And for those who fight and struggle for the power, are usually the ones who fail at that responsibility. It doesn't mean that you should shy away from anything that's placed in your hands, or the responsibility that is given to you, because maybe there are no others. Some people, they don't ask for that. And maybe we'll give an example or two later on regarding even the Khulafa al-Rashidin, radiallahu anhum. They didn't ask for that, but it was placed on their shoulders. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi told us not to be seeking and struggling for this leadership and this power. Because you do not know how you would react and behave if it was given to you. To be a leader means to recognize that you need to be merciful. Merciful before you are an authoritarian or uh, a dictator. You have to show mercy. You have to show mercy. And as we know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as Allah jalla wa ala tells us, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ You were not sent except as a mercy to mankind, to jinnkind, even to the disbelievers. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in explaining to us the divine revelation that came to him, a mercy to us, teaching us halal and haram, teaching us how to pray. There is no tasbiha that you make, there is no prayer that you make, no day that you fast, no hajj or umrah that you make, no act of ibadah that you do, except that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam, taught us that. The person says, I want to make hajj for the Prophet alayhi why? Because I want the ajar, the reward, to go to the Prophet ﷺ. You performing the hajj, the Prophet ﷺ is rewarded for that. Because you are following in his sunnah. Take from me your rights. So anything that you do that was taken from the Prophet ﷺ, he is rewarded for that. Because he ﷺ, he taught us that. So he is a mercy to us, teaching us the path to paradise. And also a mercy to the kuffar in that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned them about the dangers and the pitfalls of turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet alayhi sallam was merciful to ever whom he came in contact with, those who were deserving of mercy. And where the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
was not the choice of anybody. Had hukm Allah. This is the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the decision had to be made. And when the Imra'atul Makhzumiyyah, when the well-known woman from the tribe of Makhzum, she, came, she had stolen. She had stolen something. And they said, well, she's from such a noble tribe. They didn't maybe quite understand. And, and you know, the nobles in the past, we used to let them go. You know, the nobles, we give them a pass. The poor, the fuqara and masakin, and the du'afa, no, we will implement the judgment on them to show them that we have authority. But those who are in positions of authority and the ashraf, and we give them a pass. And this woman was from the ashraf, she is from the nobles, maybe we give her a pass. So who will go to speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and maybe you know, give her a pass? Let us choose somebody whom is beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So they chose who? Usama. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to love Usama radiallahu anhu. And he explained what had happened. And here the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, became very upset. Are you trying to intercede in one of the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So show mercy to her. There were times to show mercy, yes. And when it was an opportunity to show mercy, mercy was given and shown. But where the choice was not to give mercy, not to show mercy, but to instill justice, to implement justice, the Prophet wasallam made sure that justice was implemented. So the Prophet wasallam yes, was merciful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies to that, that he was merciful to them, and that if he was harsh with them, with his companions, they, they would have just run away. The people would have just run away if he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was harsh with his, with his people. So being merciful is an important characteristic of what it means to be a leader. The punishment, the oppression, what was done to the Prophet ﷺ is unimaginable. That not one time did he ask for revenge to be taken on individuals in Mecca. That at times that he sallallahu alayhi wa would just want to offer salah next to the Kaaba, nothing else. Not harming an individual. To the extent that he, alayhi salam, while in sujood, the kuffar, what did they do? They managed to get the insides of a rotting camel and they placed that on his back, alayhi salatu salam. The filth and the smell. Until the daughter of the Prophet, alayhi salam, helped her father, alayhi salam, to remove that filth from him. This is what the Quraysh, the mushrikun of the Quraysh, did to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala years later gave the Prophet والسلام, a choice that two angels, Malaikatul Jibal, the angels of the mountains, that two mountains, Al Akhshabain, that they would be raised and that they would come down and flatten and destroy the people. The oppression, the cursing, the killing of his beloved, things that you cannot imagine. But what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? What was his response to this? Bil arju an yukhriju Allah min aslabihi man yabud Allah wa la yushriku fi shayya. But rather, I have hope that Allah subhanahu wa taala will take from their progeny the people in the future that they would worship Allah and not associate any partners with Him. That the foremost message that the Prophet alaihi wasallam wanted for his people is for them to be saved not to be destroyed, not to be put into extinction completely, like previous nations, like Ad and Thamud. But the Prophet ﷺ wanted this message to be with these people. And similarly for us, what is our goal and what do we want for living in a place, in a city or a country where maybe there are thousands of non-Muslims? And then we say, let's say for example, the actions of non-Muslims in another place, another part of the earth, and we say, oh, evil people, wrong people, and we, want, we say this about them, and then maybe you think of your non-Muslim neighbor, maybe your non-Muslim neighbor is nothing like them. Maybe your non-Muslim neighbor is in, is in dire need of you giving da'wah to them. Do you not want to explain the beauty of Islam to those people? Do you not want them to become people who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just like you? We should want that, we should desire that, and not be a people who put up borders and boundaries between ourselves 
and those who have disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have the haq, we have the truth. And we should be prepared to be patient in teaching others about this truth. So as I mentioned, to be merciful and to be just and to be fair. Also, from the important characteristics is to be truthful. I don't mean truthful, is truthful to the call that you are calling to. So, to be trustworthy. So the Prophet ﷺ was known as Sadiq al-Ameen, the truthful one, the trustworthy one. So when he received, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ and warn your closest family. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he climbs the mountain and he calls his people. His closest family. He calls them. And he warns them. He tells them, if I was to tell you that there is a Jaish, an army behind this mountain, that they were coming here to destroy you, would you believe me? We would believe you. We know no kathib. We know no lies from you. You are a truthful one amongst us. So the Prophet وسلم, was amongst them a truthful and trustworthy person. So when the message came to them, how do they not accept it from such a person? How do they, well, he's trustworthy, he is truthful. So they made up all kinds of lies that he is insane, he is a magician, or he's a poet, all things concerning him. But they could never talk about his integrity, his truthfulness, his trustworthiness, and an example. So whatever he spoke about, alayhi salatu salam, he was an example for that. You should pray in the night time. You should establish qiyamul layl, tahajjud. No one liked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in praying qiyamul layl. And when Aisha, and you know the incident when Aisha radiallahu anhu woke up and saw the Prophet alayhi wa praying in the night prayer, his feet swollen, and she says, Ya Rasulullah, you are an individual whom Allah Jalla wa ala has forgiven that what comes and that what preceded. Should I not be a grateful servant? So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an example of how to be an abdullah. How to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In how to be the best of you are the best of those who have good character and conduct with other people. Not a person can say anything concerning his character in dealing with any human being. When it was concerning bravery, that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the first to be out there. Any khisla, any characteristic that's seen as a positive one, that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the very best at that. And as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, كَانُ خُلُقُهُ Quran. His manner, his conduct was the very essence of what the Quran stands for. And the Qur'an is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are an individual who stands up and fulfills what they say. And from the worst of people are those who say and that they don't do. لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why are you telling people to do things and you don't do it yourself? The worst people in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who say you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this and they do nothing themselves. What kind of qudwa are you? What kind of example are you? So the leader needs to be an example to others. The justice and the fairness and the morality that you want to teach people, be that person. It doesn't make any sense that you are preaching this and want people to be like that and that you yourself are morally bankrupt. Another important issue is to be aware the needs of time. And this is so important. To be hakim, to be wise in judging situations. And what do I mean by that? A leader should be aware of the situation that his people or his family, whoever he has you know, some responsibility for, what they are capable of doing. And understanding the ramifications if we behave like this, if we say that, if we make this decision, if we make that decision, the potential ramifications of that. So, the Muslims in Mecca were very weak. They were being persecuted, they were being punished, they were being martyred. 
So Al-Khabbab ibn, ibn Al-Arat radiallahu anhu, he comes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Shakawna ila Rasulillahi alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We complained to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did we complain about? We were complaining about the persecution that we were facing in Mecca. How much more we have to tolerate this? How much more we have to go through this, O Messenger of Allah? And we raised this complaint to him, alayhi salatu wasalam, while he was sitting in the shade of the Kaaba, right next to the Kaaba, while he, was, he had like a covering over himself. And they said, Ala tastansiru lana, ala tadu'u lana. Will you not seek Allah's victory for us? Will you not make dua for us? This was, this was their, their complaint and their claim to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you may say they may have right to do that because of the situation that they were in, maybe. However, the Prophet was completely aware of the situation. He didn't speak from himself. He spoke a revelation that was given to him. So he wanted to give them an example. He said, That there were people who came before you. And that there was a man that they would dig a hole for this man. They'd dig a hole for him. And after they had dug that hole, a ditch, a saw, Inshad would be placed over him and he would be put into two pieces, cut into two pieces. Yet that torture would not make him give up his deen. And then his body would be combed with iron combs and remove the flesh from his bones and his nerves. Yet that would not make him abandon his deen. By Allah, this deen will prevail. The Prophet ﷺ promised that this deen will be a victorious deen without any shadow of a doubt. Until a traveler from Sana'a to Hadramaut will fear nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, you are a hasty people. You're rushing a little bit. The time is not now. So a leader is fully aware of his situation. No doubt. Allah Taala then gave them permission some time later to leave Mecca, to make Hijrah, to go to Al-Madina, not to live in that situation forever. But there was a time and a specific time to do that. And this was given to them by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And when they reached Medina, the opportunity for them to take back their rights, to take back what they had left, was given to them. It is not that they just left everything and just we can accept it like this. Allah Jalla wa'ala gave them and these, uh, these verses to them at a particular time when it was best for them. So a leader is fully aware of when to do things at the correct time. Another couple of examples is that a leader will consult his people. A leader is unable to fulfill his responsibility except with those who are around him. So on many occasions, the Prophet ﷺ would consult his companions and consult them, and consult them. In the Battle of the Trench, when the Muslims were about to be under siege from all the major tribes in Arabia in the fifth year after Hijrah, Salman al-Farisi suggested that they should build a trench. The Prophet ﷺ took that on board and they did so. So a leader cannot fulfill their responsibility except that they have people with them. That Isa alayhi salatu wasalam had al-Hawariyun with him. Musa alayhi salam had Harun with him alayhi salam. So there are those that you need people around you to fulfill your responsibility and you should not belittle their role. That you may not be the leader but your role is as pivotal. So Okay, the men are the protectors and the leaders of, of the women. Does this belittle women? Does this put women as no value? First and foremost, these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah jalla wa ala does not belittle any believer in this manner. That they have different roles, absolutely. 
But those roles complement one another. The man can't do it on his own, and the woman can't do it on her own. That they are two partners, they have different resp responsibilities, and they will fulfill those responsibilities, responsibilities and help one another. This is key to understand. So there was no greater human being, no greater human being than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in how to be a leader. And as we know throughout history, that this example was passed down from generation to generation. In that, and in Al-Islam, if one was going to write the names of those great leaders that we had, that there are so many. So many blessed individuals who emulated the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that they tried to implement some of those characteristics that I just, that I just mentioned. The first one that came after, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. In his first address to his people when he was chosen as Khalifa to Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stood on the pulpit and he said, O oh people, I have been appointed over you, although I'm not the best among you. This is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I'm not the best among you. If I do good, then help me. And if I act wrongly, then correct me. It is also narrated amongst some of the Salaf and attributed also to a statement of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq when they would praise him. They would say good things about him. Allahumma la tu'akhidhni bima yaqulun. Do not take me account by the good things that they are saying about me. Waj'alni khayran mimma yadhunnun. Make me better than that what they think. Waghfir li ma la ya'lamun. And forgive me by that what they don't know. This is the leader of the Muslim Ummah. Humility, humbleness, aware of one's responsibility. The Khalifa for just over two years was able to defeat all those who had turned their backs on Islam at that time. They understood that the responsibility that was placed in their hands was something far greater than them. It wasn't about them. It is not the fact that you can call me, I am the mudir, I am the manager. I am the boss. Once the person has this attitude, they're doomed to fail. The work and the legacy that they have will end right with them. But a person who sees the job, the job is bigger than them. The company or whoever that they're working for is bigger than me. I'll be here for a little while and I'll move on and somebody else will take that. And that they are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he's sitting with his companions, his friends, and he tells them, make a wish, what do you think? And they're sitting in the home, tamannu. And some of them said, I wish that this dar, this house was mamlu'atum bil dhahabi fa'anfuquhu fi sabilillah. This house was full of gold, and I'll give it away in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, he says, wish, wish for more. What do you wish for? And then one of them says, I wish that this house was made like from pearls and gems and again I can give it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I can give it in charity I mean these are good things no? the person wishes this house is made of gold and give it to charity the person wishes this house is made from pearls and whatever types of gems and I give it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but again Amir al-Mu'mineen he says natamanno he said wish what do, you, what do you desire and you wish for they eventually said Ya Amir al Mu'minin, la adri mada we don't know what we don't know what else to say. We don't know what else to say. What you obviously you mean something else. And so Umar radiallahu anhu he says, My wish is that this house is full of men like who? Like Abu Ubaidat ibn Jarrah and Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa wa Hudayfa ibn Yaman. I wish this house was made of men, full of men like those men. Leaders, people who impacted humanity, people that we cannot imagine when Mu'adh radiallahu anhu was sent to Al-Yemen, the impact of the da'wah there. Uthman ibn Affan, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said concerning مَا ضَرَّ Uthman مَا فَعَلَ الْيَوْمِ And Jaysh al-Usra, when the Prophet wanted to gather whatever wealth that they had left, 
Uthman given hundreds and hundreds of camels, thousands and thousands of dinars and dananir and dirhams. Fi sabilillah. What he gave, was he the Khalifa? No, he wasn't. But that was his responsibility at that time and he fulfilled it. And when you think about Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu, in the battle of Khaybar when he was given the, the stand, an individual whom he loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love. These were great individuals from the past. But for us as Muslims, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop in us talking about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Because if you go throughout history, the people and the great leaders that we had, subhanallah, Ibn ibn Abd Aziz, rahimahullah ta'ala, take care of your hereafter and Allah will take care of your worldly life. And take care of your private life and Allah will take care of your public life. Umar ibn Abd Aziz, rahimahullah, the Khalifa for how long? Two years. Not a long time at all, but such an impact in such a short time. When you look at Salahuddin al Ayyubi, rahimahullah, as well. I mean, we could talk to Fajr about the leaders and the great individuals we have in Islamic history, all stemming back to where? Back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah, born where? Kurdistan. And then made his way into Egypt, grew up in a family, saw the plight of the Muslims, that Al-Quds had been taken away, that the Muslim blood had been shed in a way which at that time could not be remembered. A well-known Christian account written in 1962 it says, and it's an anonymous account, he's relaying uh, the quote, just a francorum. He says, I'm quoting from, you know, 1,100 after uh, Gregorian, calendar. Gregorian calendar. He said, our men followed and killing, even slaying the temple of uh, Suleiman, where the slaughter was so great that our men waded in blood up to their ankles. Even people who were just entering pilgrims, they were slain, pursuing and killing the Muslims up to the temple of Suleiman, where the enemy gathered in force. The battle raged throughout the day so that the temple was covered in blood. After such a disaster for the Muslim Ummah, that Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah was not suffice just to see that such a sacred place in Islam be conquered and destroyed like this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the victory, gave him the ability and it wasn't always victory after victory. There were some battles at the beginning that he was not successful. But then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the success. Negotiated eventually upon the walls of Al-Quds, Masjid Al-Aqsa, and that they refused. And they said, we will stay here, and if you don't, this is of course the, the Christians there, if you don't go, we will slaughter the Muslims that are there, 5,000 of them, we will slaughter them but continue to negotiate and that the terms and conditions were that you can leave freely we're not here to slaughter to you as you did to us you can leave freely we will not destroy whatever places of worship that you have but we will take it back we will ensure that it is back in the hands of the Muslims to ensure that from the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab up until prior to that maybe a hundred and so years and ever since then bloodshed and zulm and oppression this cannot continue. And so it's negotiated that the Muslims, they reclaim Al-Quds and up until for centuries, for centuries, peace, security, people living together until of course it all changed. Where once again, Al-Zulm, oppression overrides Al-Quds. We ask Allah to free Al-Quds. Amen. So throughout the history of Al-Islam, we find that, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us many individuals for us to be very proud of and happy that we have these individuals in our history. That we don't need statues, we don't need slogans, that we have real life examples of people who are here, who stood up for justice and mercy and ensured that humankind and mankind was treated as they should be treated. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to that which is correct. 
and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give victory to the Muhammad, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that we are part of it. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiya Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Jama'in wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.